Hello and welcome to another whip-cracking and temple-sacking episode of What Happened, the show that patiently waits for that time of the year when movie and video game algorithmic synergies syncs up. Oh, hey, and, and wouldn't you know it, there's a new Indiana Jones movie in theaters that was made to apologize for the last one. How fortunate, because I happen to have a tale about another Jones-branded project that was not long for this world. Uh, kinda. So, grab your fedoras and consider not stuffing the hallways of the British Museum with further stolen artifacts as I answer the question, what happened to Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings? That belongs in a museum! It was 2003, and LucasArts had just published the collective developed The Emperor's Tomb for the PC and every console but the GameCube. I forgot to mention this uh, last time, but alongside IDOS, LucasArts was another third party who dropped a ton of support for the Indigo Lunchbox starting that year. It got denied mercenaries, both battlefronts, and even the game adaptation of Revenge of the Sith with only a few Lego-shaped bones being thrown Nintendo's way. Uh, sorry, I, I just remember being really salty about that back in 2003. Anyway, since The Emperor's Tomb received solid reviews, the collective lobbied LucasArts to greenlight a sequel called the Indiana Jones Trilogy, but for reasons which remain rather murky, the pitch was rejected. A possible explanation for this might have been that LucasArts wanted to bring its two biggest franchises back under its own roof to be handled in-house. Then we decided to come and rescue you. Good job! So, in addition to Indy, a new Star Wars game was also in the cards. One thing we should all know by now about LucasArts, though, is that its history is filled with various restructurings and numerous regime changes, and this is one such occasion. Jim Ward, who started as a higher-up in LucasArts' marketing department, was promoted to its president during this very time and decided, for some reason, to significantly cut down its core development staff from over a hundred-plus to roughly a quarter of that, so progress for the first few months on both new projects was a bit on the slower side. LucasArts Vice President of Product Development Peter Hirschman was assigned the main leadership role on Indy, and it was his job to go back and forth with the designers to plan out potential story and setting ideas. One of these early pitches involved Dr. Jones somehow getting tangled up in the legend of the Monkey King, which served as the basis of Journey to the West, which served as the basis of Dragon Ball. Yes, you heard right. At some point in time, LucasArts was totally 100% legit toying with the idea of Indiana Jones just having to shoot Goku right in the face. It's been said that at one point, this was also going to be the main idea for an early draft of The Last Crusade before uh, cooler heads obviously prevailed. The team then settled on a story which largely took inspiration from Raiders of the Lost Ark, but taking place one year after the events of The Last Crusade, with Indy competing against a fellow archaeologist by the name of Magnus Voller. Competing for what exactly? Why, a MacGuffin, of course! This is where the eponymous Staff of Kings comes in, which Moses used to great effect to free his people, part the seas, defeat the bloodthirsty Anubis army, and vanquish the terrifying Scorpion King. I think that's historically accurate, at least. Do let me know in the comments below if I got some details there wrong. Once LucasArts had mapped out the various locations Indy would visit, the supporting cast, and the major set pieces, it was decided they would focus on Sony and Microsoft's upcoming next-gen consoles, but also began searching for other studios who could focus on the other platforms that were being considered. This was due to the fact that by this time, there were rumblings within Lucasfilm that a new cinematic entry in the Indiana Jones franchise was being prepped with George Lucas returning to a not-very-good UFO idea he had been toying with since the late 90s. Therefore, LucasArts felt it best to give Indy the full red carpet video game treatment, wanting to spread the good doctor across as many formats as they could. 
So with the seventh generation of consoles approaching, they wanted both their big in-house projects to push the next-gen envelope as far as possible. Deciding to use the Euphoria engine to handle all character-specific ragdolls, while digital molecular matter was chosen to govern all object-based physics. As I mentioned back in my Force Unleashed 2 video, this wasn't a great idea. Both physics engines were developed completely separately from one another, so it proved to be rather arduous to get them to play nicely. Force Unleashed pushed through this by simply being Star Wars, as LucasArts threw way more money, time, and staff at it rather than its legendary archaeologist, which, no disrespect to Dr. Jones, was the safer bet. So while the technical problems were certainly going to be a huge bottleneck, it wasn't the only thing that would halt Indy's latest globe-trotting quest, as the more time that wore on, the more it was looking like said quest had truly been cursed. In a piece on Fanbyte, Jack Yarwood spoke to a number of people who worked on Staff of Kings at some point or another, and during the course of its five-year development, there were quite a few, with 150 being the rough estimate. In the article, Tony A. Rowe, a former senior game designer at LucasArts, broke down just how the work was separated between all the different versions of Staff of Kings. We were the prime creators of the story. We were coming up with the locations, the scenario, and all that. And then we sort of farmed out these other games to release on these other platforms based on our game. There were four, Wii, PS2, DS, and PSP. Any changes to the story they wanted to do had to go through us at LucasArts. I remember one team wanted Indiana Jones to disguise himself as a magician, if I remember right. We were like, uh, no, please, no. The Wii, PS2, and DS were handled by Artificial Mind and Movement, who since have renamed themselves, or more accurately, renamed themselves back to Behavior Interactive, who nowadays are best known for their amazing breakout smash success, WET. The PSP version, meanwhile, was developed coincidentally by Amaze Entertainment, a sub-studio who were once under the Collective Umbrella, whom, if you recall, had the lead on Emperor's Tomb. While each version would have its own small quirks, level layouts, and slightly unique mechanics, the principal story thread would remain the same throughout. It was LucasArts' HD version which was designed to have the biggest differences due to all the physics engines, which were intended to drive the majority of the action, something that wasn't quite possible on the other machines. Staff of Kings was formally announced in 2005, but with only the Xbox 360 and PS3 versions being mentioned, with the very first footage being unveiled a year later at E3 2006, which, as you can plainly see, was really pushing all them fancy physics. While the first trailer didn't quite get this across, internally the team at LucasArts were concepting the idea that Indy's whip was going to be as versatile and as interactive as Half-Life 2's gravity gun, which, given all the other complications, was going to be a tall order. To make all of this possible, the team then had to staff up considerably, which was a bit harder than usual, because at the very same time, the Star Wars project, now officially known as The Force Unleashed, was doing the exact same thing. Unfortunately, a sword is a lot easier of a video game weapon to get working than, say, a whip, and coupled with the physics systems meant that the first trailer was more of a proof-of-concept video rather than a playable game, at least according to Tony Rowe. We had to combine the two engines, but the two didn't talk to each other. You had a Euphoria object that worked with Havoc, which is a pretty standard physics system, and a DMM object, and when they hit, they would go right through each other. Our 2006 E3 demo is a prototype of what we wanted to do in the future, so we show a lot of bodies flailing around in weird ways and things exploding and breaking in interesting ways. That is really us trying to fake it and then another year and a half after that, we were able to do that for real on The Force Unleashed and we were getting there on Indie. 
The getting there part was going to take quite a chunk of time, though, because while a maze and artificial mind and movement were making steady progress getting their respective versions ready for the 2007 release date LucasArts had set, the main team were lagging far, far behind. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Whatever you're doing, do it faster! Fortunately, and in stark contrast to a lot of stories I've covered here on What Happened, the higher-ups at LucasArts weren't, I, I'm sorry, cracking the whip at the core development staff to sloppily slap the game together in time for launch. One unnamed LucasArts employee said to Fanbyte, it was our money to burn, indicating that the team were being afforded a lot of slack. However, once the 2007 deadline came and went, some decisions had to be made out of necessity, such as senior designers like Tony Rowe and others being taken off indie entirely to help finish up The Force Unleashed, which was much farther along by that point. Now, while this move was not a direct blow against Staff of Kings, it would still have huge ramifications that would push Dr. Jones's fate even further into the unknown. LucasArts hired Chip Spronia and Michael Cheng direct from Sony Santa Monica and the God of War 2 team, and then took a long, hard look at Indy to see what was working and what wasn't. We started from scratch except for the story. That was the crux of the problem. When we came on, we looked at it like, what is going to be our structure? What are we going to make? We changed the camera from being a third-person camera to being an authored isometric camera, much more in line with the God of War series, which I was excited by. But when you completely change a camera system, that completely changes the game and the mechanics it's going to have," said one former staff member who wished to remain anonymous. Much of the game's code had to be rewritten because of this, which in turn pared down the in-depth hand-to-hand brawling mechanics and reduced the amount of object interactivity so they could instead focus on a more slick and streamlined experience. But just as the team were starting to make progress under this new direction, they received a bit of a wake-up call when Naughty Dog released the very first Uncharted, which was obviously more than a bit inspired by the very source material the team at LucasArts was working on. When that came out, we bought a copy of it. I remember we booted it up in the office with everybody and we were like, oh f fuck, th this is what we're trying to do said environmental artist Brandon Martonovich. Undaunted, the team pushed ahead on the new direction anyhow, crafting a polished prototype of the first level in Panama, which featured impressive dynamic water effects, puzzles, a cinematic God of War-style camera system, and even an AI partner which followed Indy around. Once everyone was happy with the result, they set about doing the same overhaul to all the other levels that had already been concepted and planned out for years, like San Francisco, Istanbul, and Nepal. It's right around here, though, that LucasArts was due for another one of their famous shakeups, which predictably resulted in a number of layoffs, including Peter Hirschman, who had originally championed the project. This was something that obviously didn't help the game's chances, but still, the team soldiered on well into 2008, where another setback befell the Staff of Kings, but not from where you'd think. The divisive reception to Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was cited by some, like writer-designer Brian Howell, as a possible reason why the project ran out of steam. We had been working on Staff of Kings for several years, and I felt that Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was a real disappointment and really let down the Indiana Jones legacy. For me, the thing that was the hardest to swallow was that we had this vision for Indy that was really on target, and it's sad for me that instead of the world getting that, they got Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Ah, he shouldn't be that hard on Indy. He was getting on in years in that movie, and to be fair, he was only working as an adventurer. Part time. Thus, sometime in late 2008, along with Jim Ward suddenly being fired out of nowhere, a decision was made internally at LucasArts, which was first reported on by IGN in January of 2009. It stated that Staff of Kings had been cancelled, 
pointing to the fact that it had gone completely dark ever since its E3 2006 debut and hadn't ever been made playable to the public or the press. Thus, it was scrapped, with its staff being relocated onto other projects. LucasArts, however, fired back, saying LucasArts remains absolutely committed to the Indiana Jones franchise. While we are aware that fans have been eagerly awaiting additional information on the upcoming game, they can rest assured that details are forthcoming. And those details did forthcome that very May, where there was a kind of bait and switch as Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings was revealed for the Wii, PS2, PSP, and DS, with no mention of the Xbox 360 or PS3. This was quite a shock to most indie fans who had been following the game because all this time, LucasArts had only ever confirmed it for the HD-capable consoles and not anything else. So to see those big-budget versions cast aside in favor of the PS2 and the Wii's sometimes uh, inaccurate motion controls was a rare, almost unheard of turn of events in the video game industry. Yours truly actually worked on a few of these versions throughout 2008 in a QA capacity, specifically for the PSP and DS, which were subject to their own constant revisions when it came to the story and the cutscenes. The amount of times that Indy's melting monster face was changed and rechanged in the DS's story sequences, well, I lost count. While it was nice at least that the broader strokes of the story lived on in these versions, they earned painfully mediocre reviews, with the PSP attaining the highest Metacritic average. Sales for them also seem non-existent, as far as I can tell. But IGN's report was accurate. The staff who had been making God of Jones or Indie of War, whatever you want to call it, had been relocated onto other projects, namely The Force Unleashed 2, which again you can learn about in this video here. Once that was released and it uh, got the reception it got, LucasArts productivity slowed down. Way down. Until its eventual closure in 2013, following the cancellation of Star Wars 1313. In between that though, the team who had been making Staff of Kings got back together and prototyped a new design for a Jones game which was much smaller scale, more akin to something like the co-op Lara Croft game Guardian of Light, but uh, nothing came of this before LucasArts closed its doors. Then for a long time nothing happened. That is, until the very start of 2021, where Bethesda announced that Machine Games, the studio behind the modern Wolfenstein titles, were taking up Indy's whip in a brand new multi-platform next-gen title, with our good friend Todd Howard producing. Two and a half years later though, we still haven't seen a single shred of gameplay and with Microsoft's purchase of Bethesda, that multi-platform console strategy has since been run back, as it's now currently coming to just the Xbox and PC, and really, that's the only update we've gotten since. With the Xbox 2023 showcase now in the rear view, it'll most likely be another year or more before we get a glimpse of Indy's next adventure, if we get one at all. I say this because it can't be overlooked how similar the situation is to the one from 14 years ago. A new indie movie is in theaters, it's been getting divisive reactions, the new game has had platforms drop from the schedule, and has gone dark once again. Let's just hope that history doesn't repeat itself and that this new adventure, whatever it's going to be called, won't wind up collecting dust and cobwebs, but instead strike it rich with… Fortune and Glory. If you know of any other arduous adventures in the video game or movie industries, do let me know in the comments below or enter the crumbling temple that is my Twitter. See you next time and thanks for watching!